1,220 Mark IV tanks were produced between May 1917 and the Armistice in November 1918. Although mechanically temperamental, often breaking down, and only travelling at walking pace, these seemingly unstoppable monsters of thick steel cloaked in exhaust smoke evoked fear and terror amongst soldiers of the German army when they appeared on the battlefront. So Andrew, we've got a really spectacular First World War tank. Can you tell us um, something about where the idea for the tank came from? They were technically known as land ships. During the manufacturing process, the hulls were being manufactured by companies that were producing water tanks. And so to disguise what these objects were uh, being produced for, they kept the name water tank and applied that to the, to the end result. And the name stuck. Mm -hmm. Because Germany had a very active uh, espionage movement in, us, in England and uh, yes, they, we right. wanted to keep them in the dark. Yes, that's right. It's about disguising this uh, wonder weapon from, from the enemy that they were intending to use it against. A German war correspondent described his first encounter with a tank. My blood froze in my veins. Crawling along the cratered battlefield were two mysterious monsters. The monsters approached slowly, limping, staggering, swaying, but no obstacle could stop them. They moved ever forward with a supernatural force. Our machine gun fire and hand grenades simply bounced off them. The tanks came in two genders. Uh, they were male and female variants. Uh, in the sponsons on the side that housed the weapons, in the male version, the front front weapon was a six-pounder uh, mm -hmm. naval gun mm -hmm. that fired a six-pound shell, mm -hmm. and all the other weapons were machine guns. In the female variant, they were all machine guns. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the initial deployment made the infantry and the crews realise that the female variant was still a potent threat. The male was much better at being able to deal with the kind of strong points, machine gun posts, dugouts, as a male variant with that six pounder rather than with the, uh, then with all machine guns. So, mm -hmm. but as much as the tank corps would have preferred all the variants, all the tanks that were produced to be male, they still ended up with a ratio of kind of one to three, mm -hmm. uh, one to two. Male, mm. female. Mm. Some of the later tanks were hermaphrodites, weren't they, as well? Maybe yes, yes, that's other. right, yes. One sponson would be would be the female with two machine guns and the other side would be, oh. uh, would, be, would, be would be male. The Mark IV female was typically crewed by eight people, a driver, commander, two gearsmen and four machine gunners. It took four crewmen just to drive the tank. Tight for space, the eight crews shared the compartment with an uncovered 105 horsepower six-cylinder Daimler engine. The close proximity of the engine meant that the toxic fumes and the heat produced were a constant problem. Temperatures inside the tank could reach 50 degrees centigrade. Heat exhaustion was not uncommon, resulting in the crew needing medical attention after spending extended time inside the tank. The noise inside the tank was intense leading the crew to communicate using hand signals. Two crew members, a driver and a commander, were positioned at the front of the tank. Their job was to control the steering, clutch, brake and gear changes, working as a team with two gearsmen. Making a turn was a complicated job involving bringing the tank to a stop before engaging low gear on one side and high on the other. This allowed a slow arching turn to be possible. A skid turn could be made by applying the steering brake while putting one track in low and the other in neutral. Weighing in at around 13 kilograms fully loaded, with a magazine containing 47 rounds of ammunition, the Lewis gun was one of the main weapons used by the Australian Imperial Force during the First World War. It was sometimes known as the Belgian rattlesnake. The Lewis gun saw extensive service with British and Australian forces as a ground and aerial machine gun and as the main gun used in the Mark IV female tank. By the end of 1918, over 15,000 303 caliber Lewis guns had been produced. Suddenly, against our steel wall, a hurricane of hail pattered, and the interior was filled with myriads of sparks and flying splinters. 
and another furious jet of bullets sprayed our steel side, the splinters clanging viciously against the engine cover. The roar of our engine, the nerve-wracking rat-tat-tat of our machine guns blazing at the Bosch infantry, and the thunderous boom of the six-pounders, all bottled up in that narrow space, filled our ears with tumult. Added to this, we were half-stifled by the fumes of petrol and cordite. Another raking broadside of armour-piercing bullets gave us our first casualty, a bullet passing through the fleshy part of both legs of the Lewis gunner at the rear after piercing the side of the tank. He lay on the floor, bleeding and groaning, whilst the six-pounder boomed over his head and the empty shell cases clattered all around him. It was soon discovered that small arms fire hitting the outside of the tank caused splashing of small steel fragments within the tank. These pieces of hot, sharp metal inflicted wounds to exposed skin, particularly to the face and the eyes. A mask was the solution. Introduced in 1917, the leather-covered steel plate mask with narrow slits for vision and a hanging chain veil to protect the face must have been as uncomfortable as it was frightening, but it did offer valuable protection. Conceived in Britain as the means of breaking the trench stalemate on the Western Front, the tank was built to crash, smash and traverse with ease the potholed moonscape of the First World War battlefield. After a hasty secret development program, the British Army first introduced tanks, originally dubbed land ships, in September 1916. Large, powerful and invulnerable to rifle and machine gun fire, the role of the tank was to clear a path and restore mobility to the infantry. The rhomboidal shape of the early tank lent itself to smashing obstacles, crushing barbed wire entanglements and crossing trenches. The rhomboid tanks, as these things generally are from their shape, um, they're meant to stay with the infantry. Uh, they're meant to take out obstacles that are preventing the infantry uh, advancing across the battlefield. Mm. So, so you're only talking short distances. Yeah, that's yeah. right. They yeah. don't need Massive to charge things. ahead So, yeah. uh, in any great um, in so you way. mentioned rhomboid tanks, can you describe why they're called rhomboid tanks? Yeah, uh, well it's the basic shape of them, so as they look like a rectangle which is being pushed over. So the track that goes all around the outside uh, was very effective in its cross country performance, in its rough ground. Mm -hmm. um, having, that, having the tracks that go all the way around the outside allowed it to get to obstacles to then be able to climb up, move forward and drop down again. Weighing in at 28 tonnes and with a top speed of 6 kilometres per hour, grit, with its distinctive rhomboid shape, is typical of other tanks of this time. Constructed of riveted 12mm armour plate, the tank was powered by a six-cylinder petrol engine centrally mounted between large sponsons on each side of the tank. Each sponson was fitted with two light machine gun ports in gimbals. A single light machine gun port was also mounted on the front of the tank. Tracks fabricated from steel travel over the entire length of the vehicle, giving it the ability to cross wide trenches. On the side of the tank is stenciled the manufacturer's identification number 4643. Later, the name Grit was painted onto the body of the tank. Grit never saw action in Europe. The tank was brought to Australia towards the end of the war as a propaganda tool and toured to raise money for the war effort. The tank's crew was made up of eight men of the permanent military forces, all formerly of the Australian Imperial Force. This all-Australian tank crew was something of a rarity. Most tanks at this time were crewed by the British, often supporting Australian infantry troops. In September 1918, the tank featured in war loan rallies in Adelaide, South Australia. There, a competition was held to name the tank. On Saturday, 14th of September, was christened Grit by Lady Galway. South Australia's newspaper, The Advertiser, reported on the event at Unley Oval, describing the tank as immense creature, more ponderous than an elephant, but low to the ground like a tortoise and very broad in the beam, like toads of vast size emerging from the primeval slime in the twilight of the world's dawn. In October, the tank was railed to Sydney for a fundraising display where audiences purchasing war bonds were allowed to climb inside the tank. 
small fundraising buttons featuring the tank were sold to further raise money. After spending time on display and later in storage at the Australian War Museum Annex in Melbourne, Grit arrived in Canberra in May 1936 for display at the Australian War Memorial. 